this is Citizen Live at One. A very good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Hussein Mohamed. Kenya has officially become a middle income economy. This is following the unveiling of a revised set of economic statistics that uplifted Kenya's economic status from that of a low income economy to that of a lower uh, middle income economy. The revised numbers show that the value of all goods and services produced in Kenya's economy is about 25% larger than was earlier estimated. Our reporter, Patrick Nguza, joins us live on phone now to explain the significance of that economic shift. Patrick. Hello, Hussein. Right, go ahead. Thank you very much, Hussein. Indeed, as you clearly put it today, the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics has brought us up to speed with the revised version of the national accounts. This is basically uh, a, a relook at the GDP, that's the gross domestic product estimate, which is the value of a group and services being traded with the country and by the country on an annual basis. And according to the Cabinet Secretary in charge of uh, National Planning and Devolution, and Waikuru, that number has now shifted from a 3.8 trillion shillings to an estimated 4.76 trillion shillings of the value of uh, Kenyan goods and services. But the big question is, what does this really mean to us? to Kenya as a country, as an economy, and also the citizens in here. And uh, the answer to that is that we've now shifted from a uh, low-income uh, level nation to a lower middle income level nation. And that means that everything, a lot of things are going to be changing from the way we relate to our economic partners, our development partners, and our trade partners, meaning that we have to be classified as a less hardship country. And so it means we might not necessarily go for economic support the same way that other lower income level countries are going for. It also means that, or it ought to mean according to experts, that there is more money in the hands of Kenyans. But is that the situation with the current uh, uh, state of affairs? Experts are saying no, that we still have Kenyans who are struggling uh, to put food on their table. The cost of living is still very high amongst many Kenyans. And so it means that we've just been elevated from a country point of view. But when we look at the fundamental challenges, both socially and politically, we are still at the same level. And so what should we do as a country? We need to look at the flagship projects that are outlined in the country's economic and development blueprint that is the Vision 2030, and ensure that those flagship projects have actually been implemented, as seen, from the Galana Food Project to, to ensure that we become a food uh, sufficient uh, nation, meaning that our people will be well fed, and all the way to the lab for to ensure that transport is actually taken good care of to the airport as there matters to do with transport and infrastructural projects and many other outlined projects which are flagship projects within the economic blueprint. But I shall be engaging experts further after this uh, particular launch, rather, so that we can actually get to understand what uh, should Kenyans expect going forward, given that we've now been elevated to say. Right, uh, Patrick, if you can still stay with me, just uh, two concerns. One, I think, is one you raised uh, in your report last night, and you've said it again now, that what does this mean uh, for Kenya? As you say, experts there being a bit contradictory, saying it means we have more cash in the hands of Kenyans, but then you're saying most of the Kenyans still, their livelihoods remain the same. And number two, you say it means um, less economic support for Kenya, or Kenyans seeking less economic support. Are we ready for that? I think as a country, we should be, if I may, uh, Usain, start to the second question, uh, are we ready for that? Yes, we are ready for that. And what we should focus on as a country is to ensure that we widen our tax net and net in those people who ought to pay taxes, not necessarily the ordinary one a inches, because they are already struggling with a high cost of living. So if we keep imposing more taxes on them, it's more of a punitive measure. But if we can look at sectors which ought to contribute a lot of revenue and ensure that no one evades these taxes, then I think the Kenya Revenue Authority has the capacity to ensure that we support ourselves through increased revenues and uh, also proper allocation. And it doesn't mean that we will solely uh, perhaps cease from going to uh, get support from these international donors, uh, partners, and uh, uh, trade partners and development partners. It will mean we will have to be very, very strategic to go for the most important support which we shall inject towards the most important projects which will have a mass kind of effect, such that it's a single project, but the trickle-down effects are going to be 
widely spread who said so as a nation we, we are at a position to actually support ourselves to increase revenues if we can net in the right people in terms of taxation the first one sorry i did not get it clearly it's all right uh, it, i think it's something you raised it as well talking about uh, whether this means uh, kenyans have more money than they used to you're saying experts there being a bit contradictory saying means more cash in the hands of kenyans and then you're saying majority of kenyans livelihoods remain the same but i guess that is a question that patrick is still seeking to answer from experts of course follow us uh you know subsequent bulletins uh for that tonight now interior cabinet secretary joseph ulele the dance counter for charity and youth education cabinet secretary professor jacob kaimeni i expected to appear before the parliament before parliament on tuesday the 14th where the house uh, reconvenes to answer to queries raised by members of parliament on issues pertaining to their dockets the three cabinet secretaries will be expected to appear before the house every tuesday from 10 a.m till 30 p.m as jackie maribe now reports with the august house reconvenes on tuesday the 14th of october it will be a session like no other in place of a normal plenary morning session it will have invited cabinet secretaries to appear before it to answer to questions raised on critical issues pertaining to ministerial functions in the places including cabinet secretaries is for secretaries and on numerous occasions been invited to appear at normal meetings and contrary to our standing orders 30 minutes after the appointed time meeting has not started the witnesses are hovering all over in the corridors sure i think it is a most uh, effective way of managing uh, time we will not in this committee of general oversight we will not entertain any such the kenyan people can get the right message from the cabinet ministers that the members of parliament will have an opportunity to ask questions on behalf of the people they represent because they have a role to represent a role to oversight and a role to legislate so by members of the cabinet appearing before the house and first on the floor will be interior cabinet secretary joseph olelenku lands the cs charity ngilu and education secretary professor jacob kaimeni looking at members 349 everyone has issues they want to raise the issue a question is raised you refer it to a committee chair what mechanism does the committee you know, as a committee have to come into your ministry find that we are somebody is asking that there was somebody who was shot down and buried and the committee chair comes and says this is a very serious matter concerns like and we will go to the bottom of it but the committee chair has no way of getting into what bottom this is the best avenue this is the best chance uh, to showcase the government agenda uh, on the floor of the house to the Kenyan people every Tuesday morning members of parliament voted unanimously to amend the standing orders of the house to form a committee on general oversight that will invite cabinet secretaries in essence it will be a committee sitting only one of the whole house but despite the members being 349 in total it will only require a quorum of 16 our concern is going to be the amount of time it will be required to be ready in the house considering that we don't have assistant ministers in all these things you have the cabinet secretary and the principal secretary often times we will be having more than one function in most cases even out of the country the principal secretary will go this way the cabinet secretary that way and if you are required in parliament and you are going to be required so many times it's going to become an issue so i hope and i'm not making an excuse at all mr speaker i hope that you will be able to indulge some of my colleagues uh, but while the cabinet secretaries appear not to largely oppose the idea they have their reservations the leader of the majority in the national assembly will be the link between the house and the executive and in consultation with the speaker forward between 10 to 20 questions as raised by mp's jackie maribe citizen live at 1 the senate committee on devolution has summoned makwene governor professor kibuna kibwana to explain the leadership crisis in the country Professor Kibwana is expected to appear before the committee on the 14th of October. The committee has also summoned the council assembly leaders and the controller of budget to appear before it on the 15th of October, while the 16th is set aside for any interested party. Addressing a press briefing today, committee chair Kipchumba Mulkomen 
insisted that the dissolution of the county of Makwedi, if it has to happen, is going to be a last option. We were expected and we were supposed to be Makwedi today for a fact finding mission. There have been reports in the public that we were going to Makwedi for reconciliation or mediation. Uh, we haven't reached there yet. We're just going to Makwedi for a fact finding mission to understand what's happening. This is not just an issue of Makwedi. It's an issue in Isiolo. It's an issue in Mandara. It has been in Marsabit. If they did not ask to be dissolved, then it would be unfortunate for Makwedi to be dissolved. Mention of a county government should be the last resort and only exercised in the very extreme of circumstances. That before you reach that level, in the spirit of the Constitution, and we are now implementing the Constitution, the spirit of the Constitution is about cooperation, is about consultation, is about dialogue. A Kenyan living in Oklahoma, United States, is being held for allegedly threatening to behead his co worker, Jacob Moredi, allegedly made those threats to uh, the unnamed lady who was his colleague at the Philippine Nursing Home, even as the woman thought he was joking. And this comes a few days after another woman was beheaded in Moore and follows a series of cases of beheading of Western captives. Samuel Rakio has the details. Jacob Moredi, a Kenyan based in Oklahoma, USA, was arrested last Friday and is being held on terror charges after allegedly threatened to behead his lady co-worker on the 13th of September this year. According to Oklahoma City Police Department spokesman Dexter Nelson, Moredi allegedly issued the threat saying he belonged to the Islamic State group ISIS who beheaded Christians. The lady, however, thought Moredi was joking not until she was informed of the group and Moredi's home country when she took it seriously. After inquiring what time she left work, he threatened to decapitate her and post it on social media. He is currently being held in lieu of payment of $1 million bond. Last Friday, a woman was beheaded in Moore, Oklahoma, and following a series of beheadings of Western captives by jihadists in the Middle East and Algeria, the police have taken such threats more seriously. Samuel Ramtu, Citizen Live at One. A witness at the International Criminal Court has claimed that former Prime Minister Raila Odinga on two occasions declared that there would be a bloodbath if Odinga did not win the 2010 election. The 25th prosecution witness made the claims in his testimony in the ongoing case against Deputy President William Ruto. Uh, journalist Joshua Sang at The Hague witness told ICC judges that the pronouncement resulted to an exodus of PNU supporters who were largely from the queer community. Uh, the witness who claimed uh, to have been present at a rally in Rift Valley where Odinga allegedly made the statement said the crowd took it from that statement that ODF supporters would attack PNU supporters. But that's one thing that was talked about and uh, this was what Raila Odinga said before the elections. He said that if the ODM does not win the elections, there will be a bloodbath, a major bloodbath in Kenya. And uh, that is why PNU supporters became afraid. And the fear spread throughout the entire region of Kericho. When was this announcement made by Mr. Odinga? What happened afterwards? Immediately after the elections, there would be war because Raila had just said that if he did not win the elections, there would be a bloodbath. And that is why there was this major worry. And some of them had to leave, leave the locality even before the elections. Uh, you said uh, there were two occasions. One was on television. And the other one was on location number three. First, the television. Um, did you actually hear of the voice of Mr. Odinga making that declaration? And uh, you could hear it from the TV. Was that the first time you heard Mr. Odinga say those words, according to you? 
Raila haikuwa mwisho wake wa kuongea hivyo alikuwa ameongea mengi several times even before that date Deputy President William Ruto says the government will address challenges in the health sector including grievances by health workers wants to ensure the delivery of healthcare services is not interrupted as a result of industrial disputes speaking in Wasan Gishu County the Deputy President said the Ministry of Health will engage with nurses so as to resolve outstanding issues which have led to the health workers threatening to down their tools in recent months health workers including doctors and nurses have lamented that the devolution of healthcare has worsened working conditions in the sector Speaking during the 56th annual National Nurses Conference at AIC Fellowship Church in Eldoret, the Deputy President said that the free maternal health care program introduced by the government has transformed maternal health care in the country. He lauded the First Lady Margaret Kenyatta for her Beyond Zero campaign, which has enabled many mothers access maternal health through mobile clinics. The Deputy President further assured nurses that the government will address their grievances. I want to confirm to you that we have instructed the Ministry of Health to make sure that they engage the nursing fraternity so that their issues are identified and brought so that government can address them. Ruto said that there is a health bill to be tabled in Parliament that will help streamline health services in the country. He also added that the government has displaced 95 billion Kenya shillings countrywide for the health sector, with 60 billion Kenya shillings having been dispersed to the counties. He added that the government is committed to improving the working environment for health workers. We believe that with this policy, and subsequently with the passage of the bill into law, and with the establishment of regulations that will support the law, we will have a much more clearer framework to address the issues of concern to nurses and doctors in our country. However, the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Khadija Kasachon, who had accompanied the Deputy President, was booed after referring to the nursing profession as a calling that required commitment. From the national government, we are there. In fact, you are seconded to the counties. That was the first agreement. Yes. That's it. A statement that did not go down well with the nurses. <laughs> Jeremiah Mungai, who represented the nurses during the conference, told the Deputy President that the nurses are open to dialogue and dismiss claims that they are a stumbling block to improved health services in the counties. People narrowly escaped death on a lorry they were traveling in caught fire at Sugungai Estate along the Kapsabet Shabakali Road in Nandi County. The two, the lorry driver and the loader, claim the lorry developed a mechanical problem that resulted uh, in the fire. Some to the Dana tells you. A peaceful night was disrupted and transport partially paralyzed for hours in Surungai Estate in Kapsabet. When the lorry that was transporting timber from Kisumu to Nairobi caught fire in the middle of the road, rendering a section of the road impassable. <laughs> For Surungai residents, it was a long, tiring night as the fire, which started at around 8 p.m., lasted for hours. The residents subsequently turned the heat on the Nandi County government, accusing it of failing to purchase fire engines to serve the area. Safi Godana, Citizen Live at one. Environmentalists have expressed fears that illegal logging of the endangered red cedar tree in Samburu County could lead to extinction. True extent of the illegal logging has come to the fore after 1,200 posts were intercepted in Samburu County who have been transported to the port of Mombasa. Martin Munene has the details. 
the rate at which the red cedar tree is being felled here is alarming. This is despite it being an endangered tree species protected through a presidential directive in 2007. The red cedar tree that can live up to 300 years and grow up to 200 feet tall is sold for a mere 50 shillings per 7 feet pole by the locals here, according to Losuk Location Environment Chairman Edwin Losenge. <laughs> The Kenya Wildlife Service head in Samburu County, Richard Lamerakat, has termed the situation as serious and has called for the cooperation between law enforcement agencies and the communities to curb the logging menace. Our observation, our intelligence collection is that the community are playing a very minimal role in trying to deter this problem. County Executive Committee member in charge of environment and natural resources, Richard Mbe, has said that the red cedar in Samburu County is facing a real threat of extinction. He says the county government is working on legislation that will protect the cedar tree and that his ministry will move to sensitize the community on the need to conserve forests. Our forest, at least, uh, is our livelihood. Uh, without forests, we will face a lot of problems. The Bay has also called on the members of the Samburu communities to help with maintenance and preservation of the forest cover, saying that the forest is home to wild animals that are a major source of revenue for the county through tourism. Martin Munene, Citizen Live at One. Business at Bukura Market in Kakamega County was on Monday paralyzed for the better part of the day after students from the nearby Bukura Agricultural Training College went on the rampage, demanding increased security within and outside the institution. Students claim their colleagues who live outside the institution are frequently attacked by thugs at night. There's such a recent incident in which three students were attacked by a group of young men and bad were badly injured. Students reported retaliated by torching the houses of the suspected attackers. They have asked the institution's administration and police to improve uh, their security. Badia vijana huwa unakaa maeneo fulani wakiangalia kwamba wanafunzi wana pesa nyingi sana. Wanapoangalia tu ukiwa na baki wanajua kwamba hiyo baki imebeba laptop na ukiwa na umenunua pengine umenunua vyakula dogo dogo wanasema kwamba we una pesa nyingi sana. Ikiwa itawezekana administration na political leaders wa hii area wabutere na hata lurami washikane pamoja waweke street lights kwa hii barabara. Police in Nyandarua County have impounded an assortment of weapons suspected to be intended for use in criminal activities. The weapons, which include 29 bows and 49 arrows, were impounded last night at a home in Kasuku area within Nyandarua West. According to the Nyandarua North OCPD, Benjamin Onsongo, the weapons are believed to have been made in the area and were to be transported to other regions for sale. Onsongo commended the public for their tip-off, which led to the discovery of the weapons and pledged to hunt down the suspects that are believed to be behind the syndicate uh, who is still at large. Well, stay tuned to Live at One Business and Sport News still ahead.